So now we're going to take that PX phase diagram. It's kind of like we flip the Y axis. We don't really flip it upside down, but it looks like we did. Uh, because again, we, we knew that low pressure, low vapor pressure means a high boiling point. And so that's on the left would be the low pressure, uh, low vapor pressure for, for um, pure B. And over on the right would be the boiling point of pure B. Um, and this right here. You know, so so this is the boiling point of pure B in this particular situation. So these things right here are the boiling points. So T B and T A. Remember over here on the left we had the liquid phase was the high pressure region, it was pure liquid. Now the high, high temperature region is vapor. And the cold temperature region is liquid. The low pressure region was vapor, right? So these, these have all flipped places. So you really have to know, are we looking at a PX phase diagram or a, or a TX phase diagram? I like, T, I like them both, I guess, I, but I really prefer the temperature uh, temperature composition phase diagrams because they have boiling temperatures, which again, this would be for a particular pressure. And so this, these are all boiling points because this is the phase diagram at one atmosphere. So everything on there has a vapor pressure of one atmosphere for the mixture. Now we don't have Routes law or Henry's law or anything for the temperatures. Those are vapor pressure, uh, partial pressure diagrams. Um, for the boiling points, we have these two phases in equilibrium, and we look at the different compositions. We typically emphasize the different compositions between liquid and vapor. And so this is really, this TX phase diagram is used a lot in uh, separations and distillation. So here's the distillation terminology. So this is an infrared camera that I have in the lab and I took a picture of a distillation apparatus. And you can see the temperature gradient. So it's hot down there in the pot where you've got the heating mantle, you've got the distillation column, we've got some chain in there um, just to provide surface area so it can um, set up that temperature gradient and interact with the gas phase. Now this looks like a cold region, that's just because the fractioning column has a glass um, sleeve around it, okay? And so that's where the, that why it looks like it gets cold here in the middle, but it's just a real temperature gradient from down here at the pot. This would be the boiling point of the mixture. Up here would be the condensate temperature. So let's look at these. So up at the top where the thermometer is, that's the temperature of the last thing to condense in the fractioning column. You guys should remember this from organic, yeah. Then this in the collection flask is called the condensate. So these are vocabulary words that I will use, that are terms that I'll use, so you need to know what I'm talking about. Um, the condenser is just, again, a cold region, typically water-cooled, so that this uh, condensate is, is captured in the liquid phase and, and collected in the collection flask. That's a fractioning column, you know that. Um, this is called the still bottom, and I also call it the pot. Okay, so down in the bottom is the pot, and you have the, the condensate and the, and the collection flask. Okay. And then that, that is at the pot boiling temperature. So rarely do we have the, a thermometer down here in the boiling pot, but I always do. I, always, I use thermocouples, and so instead of using a, a thermometer up here in the top for the condensate temperature, I have, a, I have a port at the top that has two thermocouples that pass through. One goes all the way to the pot, and the other one stops at the condensate, and I can adjust the heights of those. And so I can always monitor the, the pot boiling temperature and see if it shifts, and it will, um, it will creep up as all of the volatile substances leave, then that pot temperature will, will move up. So here's uh, some diagrams, liquids separated by distillation. And I remember, uh, when we were studying chromatography and instrumental analysis, they were talking about theoretical plates. 
And I asked what the deal was with theoretical plates, and they said, well, the plate idea dates back to bubble plates in the column. So the fraction and column that we have in, in our chemistry labs are just open in the middle. We might stuff some glass beads or some steel chain in there to provide some con surface area for condensation. And what happens is, let's say we have something here that um, is this mixture. Here, let me go back over here. Is this mixture, oh goodness, let's try this again. There we go. So we have something right here that is this much B. So it's a little bit B and a lot of A. And we want to collect the B. We want to um, pull whatever that B is out. That solution is going to boil right here. And what is the composition of the vapor above that pot? So it's boiling in the pot right here. The vapor, look at this, it's much enriched in B because B is the low boiler. See, these on the, on the far right and left are the boiling points of the pure substances. And so this is the boiling point for pure B. And this is the boiling point for pure A. So since the boiling point for B is much lower, then the, the vapor should be enriched in B. Now it's not pure B, it's, it's about 50-50 in that first distillation. If we had just a single distillation step, which you might see on some of the old um, chemistry literature, and it used to be like even, well anyway, you, you see on like some, I think the Boy Scout Merit Badge for chemistry was, was what's called a retort, and it's a single distillation piece of glassware. It, it looks like this. It's a piece of glass blown like this. Have y'all seen that before? It's a single piece of glass. You put your liquid in here and you boil it and it's got a sort of the, the, the condensing column is built into the flask. And, it, and then the, the more purified substance will drip out of here. So if you just had a single distillation step, then you've enriched it in B. You would collect this and then after the first step, it would be 50-50. So you've increased the concentration of B in the, in the condensate. But if this condenses in the fractioning column, then this is the condensate. And look, it boils at a lower temperature. So if it starts to come down that column, it's warming up as it goes towards the pot and it all boils off again. And when it boils off, the composition of the vapor of that little boiling droplet is very enriched in B. And then it moves up and it condenses when it gets colder in the column, it condenses when it's this temperature, okay? And now it's very rich in B, and if, if it moves down a little bit, it gets warmer, and it boils off, and it's more enriched again. And so this one, if we just had three, three theoretical plates, we could get almost pure B. If those lines are closer to each other, you might need five theoretical plates, or even more, to separate. So this idea of theoretical plates is, is the um, number of condensation and reboiling steps you need to separate the two. It's a measure of how similar the molecules are. Um, if the molecules are very dissimilar, then you can separate them with a single distillation step. Like if you have, say, oil and water, and you, and you heat up the oil, if there's water in there, the water's going to come off. You know, and oil boils it or decomposes at 300. So you can get that oil up to above 100 C, all the water would leave. They're very dissimilar substances. If you're trying to separate benzene and toluene, not so easy to separate. It's very similar um, molecules. <clears throat> so I asked about my analytical professor about this idea of theoretical plates. And he said, well, it dates back to bubble plates, which aren't used anymore. And that was a shame that he said that because I think he meant in academia, okay? That they're definitely used in refineries, okay? And so here's a, a bubble plate. I'm just kind of showing you what's going on here with the, the distillation apparatus. That mixture's boiling at 128F and then the condensate is coming out at 105. So there's your temperature gradient. So these bubble plates, this, 
They're still used in refinery separations. They're not typically made in, in laboratory separations. They don't make them out of glass anymore. They used to have little bubble plate columns that, that you could use, but now um, we've got you know, glass beads and other things that work just as well. <clears throat> and so the theoretical plate calculation is, is a computed amount of bubble plates that would be necessary for a comparable separation. So do you remember what the theoretical plates were for some of these capillary gas chromatographs? From instrumental analysis, GC? They were in the 150 thousands, right? And so you could separate very easily benzene and toluene, some things that have very similar chemistry in those, those columns. Because you could separate such similar substances, it was as if you had a, a fractioning column that was mile high with 150,000 bubble plates in them, and you could finally get benzene and toluene apart. Okay. And so this is a picture of, of kind of what you see in a refinery. Um, but people are, I went on and looked, I wanted to get a better picture of the bubble plates, and I found a renewed interest in distilled spirits. Like people are making bubble plate columns to, to separate whiskeys and bourbons and so on. There's a lot of microbrews now that microbrewing has gone away from beer, and now there's, you know, micro stills, I guess, and people making moonshine and, and, and uh, other alcohols commercially. And so they're making commercial bubble plates again that you can buy. And this one's made out of copper or brass. And, and the way it works is you can see over here on the left, the vapor comes up and it has to go through this little cap and the vents are down below the liquid. And so to get a really good separation, you want to make sure that you have good contact with the liquid so that if it wants to condense, it can. If it's, if it's still in that region, a, a temperature for the more volatile substance to leave, the more volatile substance will go up and go to the next layer. And if you have, a, if this is a refinery, kerosene or a heavier hydrocarbon may come out here. Gasoline may come out here, you know. Diesel would be further down. And so that's how a refinery works. They boil crude oil and have a tap at the different boiling points. So they're not separating octane. They're separating a range of boiling points. So that's why gasoline, you can go on Wikipedia and look at the composition of gasoline and look at a GC of it, and there's just peak after peak after peak. And all of those have a very similar boiling point, and they come off. All of the isomers, you know, structural isomers, they all come off at a similar range of boiling points. And, and so they will have different blends and temperature profiles for summer driving or winter driving. And, and you know, they will fine tune those things. Now here's a picture of a fractioning column in industry. So once again, you know uh, from chemistry, from this class down here is hot. And up here is cold, colder, may still be hot to us, but it's a temperature gradient. And then right there in the middle uh, would be that, that maintenance and sampling platforms, and then you have your fraction taps. So the pipes that come out of these tall columns are at those bubble plate layers where the condensate is just being pulled off. So now you know how a refinery works. It's super cool. Can you close that door for me? They're a lively group. Are those the columns when you drive by that usually have the flame coming off the top? No. So people think, I mean, and yeah, okay, so that is, people say, why are they wasting this gas? It's obviously a combustible substance, right? Um, a lot of that gas is very difficult to, to capture. It's gas that's residual or dissolved in the liquid. And so they, say, pump this gasoline over to a large storage tank. And then that large storage tank has gasoline in it and the sun is shining on that, that tank and it's building pressure. And so it's like they're heating a closed container, which is never safe, okay? And so they have a vent valve and that vent valve has a pilot light on it. Now, if they just vented all that methane, methane is, a, if you look at the common comparison of methane to CO2, it's much worse of a greenhouse gas. And so it makes actually environmental sense to burn that methane to make it CO2 versus let methane come out the top. Plus it's 
nothing's not good for you. There's maybe other gases, butane that stink. Okay, and so some of these more volatile substances that are in the gas and diesel and kerosene will build pressure in those enormous tanks. They vent that off and they burn it, which doesn't seem environmentally friendly, but it actually is. <laughs> because otherwise you're letting butane and propane and all of these combustible gases and smelly gases go into the community and they're like, this is not good. It's bad for you know just the aesthetic environment. And then also those are greenhouse gases. Uh, that are worse than CO2, so they, they burn those off. Now, if they have a bad event, there'll be a huge flame, like a lot of pressure or something like that, an excursion in pressure, but a lot of times those flares are safety devices to keep something from bursting. Yeah. I remember driving by a couple of the big refineries down in Corpus Christi, mm -hmm. and they have a bunch of the big fractioning towers and yeah. of towers that look rather similar, but they yes. big old flames yeah, so what they want to do is they want to get that flame as far away from anything else that might be combustible. So it's really tall tower and a flame on top. So it's burning up there. So if there's any kind of, you know, if they're doing a transfer and they spill a little fuel, fuel or whatever, you don't want a flame nearby. You want that flame as far away as possible. Yeah. So here's a um, diesel production. So uh, not just diesel, but I mean crude oil down at the bottom, they, they have... Uh, crude oil in this fractioning column, and then these are the things that come off. So liquid propane or liquid petroleum gases can be collected. Let me show you what this one, what the LPG is. Um, you know, if they get enough of that off, they can compress that and put that into propane tanks and butane lighters and all of those things. So those uh, butane lighters, this is the lightest fraction that comes off of these columns. A uh, gasoline is the, the money maker. Okay, um, it's such a great portable fuel. You saw that from the QSAR lab that you know it's um, it's it's got good heat and thermal properties. It's easily transported. It doesn't have a high vapor pressure, so it's not dangerous from a pressure standpoint like propane would be. Um, jet fuel is a little heavier. It's kind of like a um, in between diesel and gasoline, and the diesel fuel is also a big money maker. I don't know the difference between aviation fuel and jet fuel, but yeah. Oh, I know what's going on here. This, they're essentially the same, but what's going on here is some of these heavier oils. There's a, you can do spectroscopy on some of these fractions and calculate what's called a double bond equivalent percentage. And if it's got a lot of double bonds on it, it's a darker oil. And you can use that to crack that molecule in half. So you can react it and hydrogenate those double bonds and make a lighter fuel. And so that's what's going on here with the cracking units. They're cracking those molecules where there's double bonds and they're adding alkyl groups, alkylation, and that's where the catalysts come in. So the, you might hear of a cat cracker or it's a cat catalytic cracker. So that's a big money maker. Because these really, really heavy oils may be less useful uh, for transportation. And so if you can add alkyl groups and hydrogens, you can make a, a, a better, better selling fuel. Then we don't waste anything. Then the really heavy oils will burn in an industry that can I have specific boilers for that. And then if it's so heavy that it won't burn or pump well, we put it on our roads. So asphalt base. So, and then last we have like a coal-based material called coke at the bottom, and we'll drill that out. And again, it's a real dirty fuel, but it's something that can be used in, in industry processes that can burn a dirty fuel. And so this is, um, we will have to start with azeotropes next time, but that was a good, good introduction into TX phase diagrams. So we didn't quite finish this set of notes, but this is a great place to stop.